Hello friends, this is Justin. And I'm Fibonacci. This is my son Fibonacci. And uh, earlier this year, we cut a record. Where did we travel to cut that record, kiddo? Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it was really quite a whirlwind. We set out with a whole production team from our house here in St. Pete. And, um, I don't know, what were the good parts about it? Who do we have on the record? Let's figure that out. Cory Walker. Uh, Cory Walker. Let's tell their instruments too. Cory Walker. Cory Walker on the banjo. Cory Walker on the five string banjo. And, um, Yakubasaki on the. Is that really a mandolin? <laughs> Yakubasaki on the A shaped mandolin. Who else? Keep going. Stargill on the upright bass. Jake Stargill on the upright bass. We had um, Harry Clark also on the mandolin. Who do we have on the fiddle? Uh, Jakob again. No, no, on the fiddle. Uh, Jakob doesn't play the fiddle. Oh, no, we didn't have Puba on the fiddle, for, not for the record. We had Christian, remember? We had Christian Ward on the fiddle. And um, Alan Cook on the Dobro, I think, did we name everybody? Uh, you know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, gotta get stars on the bass again, I think, right? Playing with Jake Starge on the bass was already interesting. First of all, the guy was producing the record, engineering it at the same time he was playing bass. He'd never seen anything like it, first of all. Second of all, he's one of my favorite guitarists out there. <laughs> he's playing bass on my record while I'm playing guitar. So, you know, to play guitar while someone who's unambiguously better than me at guitar plays bass, and, you know, I'm happy to own that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a capable guitarist. I've been playing guitar 25 years, but, you know, Starge is like another, another life form. Um, and, you know, I had Jakob there with me, who is very new to the scene, and, and particularly new to mandolin. He's only been playing mandolin for like a year and a half. And uh, <laughs> he switched to mandolin from ukulele because, uh, you know, I, I, I was like, hey man, I, I think I want to start cutting some more serious bluegrass. I need a mandolin if we're going to do a live at these crypto events. And um, he was gracious enough to do that, but, you know, and it's incredible. He flew from Prague to... Uh, to Nashville to cut the record. But he, you know, he's kind of the junior mandolin player given that he's kind of, you know, new to mandolin. So we had Harry Clark, who's a monster in the mandolin. And, uh, you know, everybody in the, the ensemble, they were all people I were really honored to play with, people whose music I love and celebrate. Um, we've, we've seen Billy Strings how many times? Many, many times. We've seen him play lots of Christian songs. Not she's counting. How many times have you seen Billy? 18. More than 18 times. And uh, 20, I think that's about right. And, um, you know, we it was actually through that, through connections, through the kind of Billy Strings family that, that we found this scene. Um, and it was also through that lens that we began to hear the stories of how the music industry in Nashville uh, doesn't treat musicians of whom we are um, humbled to work with and and enjoy listening to uh, doesn't treat them the way that we think is befitting uh, an information age creative society uh, in particular it has started to really occur more strongly to me that uh, the model of um, the music industry which is sort of um, centered around like ownership intellectual property and policing of who is and is not allowed to listen to a song or, or to view a piece of artwork, um, that doesn't seem to fit with information technology. It doesn't seem to fit with the ability that we now have for music to um, proliferate. The idea that every time you click a play button, there's got to be some little subroutine inside the player that decides, oh, is this person allowed to listen to this? Is that person allowed to listen to this? Uh, are all the people in the room authorized to listen to this? Are any microphones that are listening that are going to record a video now they're parsing the audio in the background and deciding uh, these these intellectual property concerns as understood uh, by a single kind of monolithic entity? Um, that, that doesn't make sense. I, I don't want my music to be treated that way. I want my music to proliferate far and wide. I want any time 
there are ears that are interested in my music, I want them to hear it. Anytime there are minds that are interested in making something with my music, I want that to be available to them. Uh, but I also want to be paid fairly for my music. Um, I spent almost 40,000 US dollars making this record. And, uh, you know, that included, um, that included some things that maybe don't traditionally go into making a record. Uh, like we had very robust childcare because a couple of us wanted to bring kids along and I thought it was very important to involve the kids in the process of making the record. Um, so, you know, the idea that we've come up with is uh, to figure out ways to separate the intellectual property mechanism from, of the music from the payment mechanism whereby artists can get paid and uh and also the thrust of the commemoration of the music which i think people do like obviously people like collecting vinyl records uh, but many of us who kind of live in the in the the mental and um i would even perhaps say spiritual processes of cyberspace are also interested in the online ways that we can commemorate our involvement in this music so the process we've come up with is pretty simple, using uh, threshold uh, access control, which is a technology that I've been working on for years, and a lot of the people uh, at Threshold um, have, are, are also very interested in, in music and interested in understanding the way specifically that Threshold cryptography uh, can empower the arts. Uh, so, you know, the process is the album gets encrypted, is placed online, you know, you can't listen to it because it's encrypted, and, um, and then there's a smart contract. Ten, we have two weeks, ten, starting tonight, today. Uh, 10 ETH go into the smart contract and then the decryption key is available uh, through the smart contract that, and then it can be used to decrypt the album and listen to it. Um, I, I, I don't know that this is a perfect model. I can imagine carving out some licensing that makes maybe even more sense. Like if we wanted to put our music on Spotify, maybe we'd have a license that says, that this music is free in the sense of distribution and remix, but if you run a streaming service and you pay royalties, then you have to treat it as copyright. You know, I can imagine that. Uh, and maybe in time we can work with the folks like at archive.org and EFF to uh, carve out the licensing for that. That's something I'm interested in doing with the money that we raise. These are all ideas that uh, if we raise more than the 10 ETH, which I, I hope we do, I hope people see fit to contribute, um, these are ideas that are kind of next in line. Uh, to, to use this money for. Um, I don't, I, ha I have some concerns. I don't want to live in a world where, and I don't mean to fear monger here, but when I hear the voices of the intellectual property industrial complex, uh, which sometimes you hear even at like IBMA, which is a, a bluegrass event, you, you know, it's a sort of very strong thrust of free sharing of Americana, of the musical tradition. When I hear the, the, advocacy, let's call it, um, generously, of the copyright industrial complex. It sounds like a world where you and I would have to pay a royalty to teach our kids how to play Salt Creek. And I, I honestly believe there are people who see dollar signs in, in those processes. And um, that's obviously not the way that the tradition of bluegrass, of Americana, of, uh, of Delta Blues, of the great journey of the banjo from Africa to the various musical traditions of the journey of the dobro from the streets of the Czech Republic to our musical traditions. Um, it's not in, in keeping with those journeys. Our, our tradition is one of, of sharing of our cultures and of our music and of our ideas. And uh, I think that um, one of the things that has made bluegrass great is that people came down from the mountains looking for play on AM radio. And to do that, they had to modify their music a little. They had to say, okay, we're not gonna bring the drums down from the mountain. And so they developed this style where the strings keep the rhythm and that gives bluegrass its characteristic sound. And the same is true of many different traditions within the scope of Americana. And now we sit in another moment where we have this musical innovation. We have the ability to do blockchain based publishing and, and distribution uh, and some interesting mixes in between. Uh, and I think that um, it's, it's a time for us to consider how we steward this tradition. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited for my kiddo to, to be exposed to this music in, in his journey of learning about what music is and how it works in the world. And what? What is music? He says he knows what music is.
<laughs> so obvious. Is it obvious? I mean, yeah. We all think we know what music is, and I think everyone does, in fact, know what music is. But it, when you're asked to explain it, it's not that easy. Music is something that is deeply characteristic of the beauty of humanity. Uh, it's one of the most important expressions of art as it is over time, small bits of time, like the, the beats of a song, long epochs of time as we hear the evolution of styles of music. Uh, it marks the time, uh, much as technology marks the time. And at this moment we have uh, a bit of a crucible in time where we get a new chance to consider how we want to regard intellectual property and how we want to regard people's right to listen to and use the music that inspires them. And, and that's what I'm hoping Revealer will be. So tonight we deploy Revealer 1, the first Revealer contract. Uh, and then uh, I'm interested in, in other creative folks. It doesn't have to even be music. Uh, music, photography, video arts, visual arts. Um, I'm interested to see how folks can use this Revealer tech going forward, and we look forward to deploying Revealer 2 and Revealer 3, and um, just seeing how this thing goes. I don't know if you can see Notch on the camera, but he's playing a little, he's got his own little, uh, he's, he's got a little headband, it's an upright bass, hopefully you can hear that in the microphone. Uh, <laughs> that's all I really wanted to say. Um, you know, I'm not one to be short-winded, I know this has been a little bit long. Um, but I hope that um, on the basis of the things I, I've said here that you see fit to contribute to the project. It's very important to me. It will help us out a lot. And um, I'm, I'm just fascinated to see what cryptography can do for the arts. And uh, I hope you are too. you have anything else to say about that? Right, you want to play, it? play a little on your uh, bass? Uh, your uh, elastic band bass? You can go back up to the microphone and carry us out.